So I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. And um, first of all, thank you all for coming. I actually like that you're eating because right after lunch, then you're not you're going to be tired. So right now, I should be getting you when your energy is going up, right? Your blood sugar is going up. Um, I'm Jean Brittingham. I'm the uh, Director of Operations and Sustainability at Caterva. And I'll tell you about a little bit more about Caterva in a few minutes. But I first wanted to just set up the dialogue that we're having today. I'm very excited to have you here, and we really do want this to be dialogical. So I encourage you as you're going through and listening to our panel members this morning to take notes and ask questions. We have a couple of mics we'll be sending around so to make it really easy, or just jump up, and it's a small enough room that can probably work as well. Um, really, when we started looking into this question, and, and I, if any of you have read the declaration, this piece on empowering entrepreneurship is, is towards the end of, of the document, but what we really started to realize was that entrepreneurship, which is a way to quickly scale new ideas and is the only really successful way to scale new ideas and actually build new jobs, really scales with, uh, with several things coming into place. Um, the presenters today are going to take two fairly different, unique examples of solutions applied and scalability and how what was created in order to allow that to happen. But here's a few things that we know for sure. They need some funding sources, and they need some funding stability in the early years. We need to provide a sandbox. And, and the terminology of sandbox and technology world is a place where you put everything before you make it public, and you can move it around and play with it. So when I think of a sandbox, I think of a way of making things safer um, in terms of experimentation while things, so things can scale. They need convening power. We need to be able to bring innovators together to make things happen. They need, they need to be visibly supported, and, and one of the ways we can do that as Nexus Solutions supporters is to visibly support them through the platforms that they're engaged in and the innovators that are, the organizations that are out there seeking innovators, and several of those are here today. Um, we, we need the science group of, uh, within Nexus and all science to be supporting entrepreneurs by identifying and advising them. We also need Nexus mentors with experience on the issues. Nexus issues are systems thinking issues. And many times, people who have an expertise and a deep technology in one area go after the solution in that one area. And they could use advisement and support and critical thinking around systems thinking and the global connections who can help them advise to move closer to a nexus solution. So here are some of the dialogue questions we want to put in our put in the room today and invite you to incur, engage with us. How can we assure strong signals to take to take shape for entrepreneurs? How we, can we send those signals out? Think about market signals for entrepreneurship in particular. What where are the solutions? Where are they happening them? How do we get them into a pipeline so that they they are known and that they can scale? And then how do we assure the nexus aspects? of success are captured. So if this is an innovation that relates most to water, but there are clearly nexus solution and elements engaged, how do we begin to capture that? Because it's in the, in the capturing that we have um, a body of knowledge to begin talking about what is a nexus solution. And examples are always better than any amount of language that we can try to put around it right now, right? Um, I'm, as I said, I'm with Caterva. We are all about accelerating our positive future, and we do that through crowdsourcing scale around innovations, particularly um, innovations in sustainability areas. Caterva's mission is to identify and accelerate the spread of the world's most promising game-changing innovations to address the pressing challenges of our time. We are the global clearinghouse for disruptive innovation. That last one I'll say is a, um, a visionary statement, but that's where we're aiming to, to be. We've done this by building um, overlapping networks that are NGOs, GOs, um, businesses, corporate, corporate entity foundations, partners of all shape that do a lot of the same kind of work that we do. And within that community, we have specific things that people do. Um, the first is they uh, spotters, which is just what it is. They help us spot the innovations. They give them to us and help us uh, put it into the pipeline. And that gives us hundreds of nominations a year. And validation panel, scalability panel, policy panel, impact panel, 100 plus people, natural scientists, executives, uh, policy experts, and sustainability professionals and experts that help us evaluate the innovations that come in across 10 different categories. So 
So if you go to the website at Caturva.net, you'll see a broad range of categories. So we are kind of a nexus in a mega way, but we do look individually down those, down those silos to find the innovations. So that is where, where our Nexus Challenge comes in. This is the, um, the beginning of April. Right now, the Awards Council is meeting. The panel work has been finished. And the beginning of April, we'll be re, um, announcing our third, our 2013 um, winners. Category winners are already announced. And the 2013 winner will be announced the first part of April. Caturva Solutions is where we're going next. So we're taking this same process of overlapping and connected and strong networks and using that to focus on one specific focus area. The reason, one of the reasons I'm so excited to sit with, help Felix in getting this conference together and to be here today is because the focus that we've chosen for the 2014 launch of Solutions is resilient watersheds. And the reason for that was we looked at so many different aspects of water. And as we began to let, look at these aspects, it became clear that we were going to have to fractionalize them or silo them to look at innovations. And we wanted to do something that was much more integrated, comprehensive, and nexus approached. So Watersheds gives us the opportunity to do that. Um, it's a global multi-stakeholder collaboration with an in, uh, uh, innovation platform online that invites the crowd to come in and engage with innovators. And over the next several, we'll launch this in September, over the next several months, we'll be putting together coalition partners and deeply and, and bugging all of you to help us find the innovations out there that are making the biggest difference in resilient watersheds and watershed health. So it's very basin focused, it's very focused on uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration and finding the best so solutions that are already working help them get exposure, ref get refined, and get implemented. So I think now we're going to Aneri Patel. Aneri is from the UN Foundation and is going to give you a, a great little view into a project, project that they're working on there. Your slide should be up now. Hello, is it working? Okay, great. Um, Hi, I'm, I'm Anari Patel, and I'm a senior associate for Energy Access at the United Nations Foundation. I want to thank Felix for inviting me to present at this really important conference. I'm also a UNC alum, go Heels. <laughs> so it was fantastic to come back to my former campus and present on what I'm working on. Um, so first, a little bit of background before I get into the slides. Um, the United Nations Foundation was started by Ted Turner 13 years ago as this famous $1 billion gift to the United Nations. What we do is we support UN campaigns and initiatives. The one that um, I, I'm going to talk about is Sustainable Energy for All, which is the UN campaign to bring universal energy access to the world by 2030, uh, double energy efficiency rates, and double renewable energy rates. What the, United Fation, what the United Nations Foundation does on this is that we've created this energy access practitioner network which has actually now about 1,600 members that work on on-the-ground solutions delivering clean energy to off-grid communities. Um, out of a survey that we did, about 10% responded that they have uh, cumulatively provided power to over 50 million homes. And that's just 10% of our network. So think about all the work that entrepreneurs are doing today on these issues and how we really need to help them in addressing their business needs to really address these challenges. They come from 191 countries, uh, so it's very global, our network, and um, it's, anyone can join this network. Our website is energyaccess.org, and you can sign up, and it's free, and you can learn all about the most up-to-date news and information and support that we provide to anyone who's working in this space. So to talk a little bit about the nexus, um, it's very clear that energy is the golden thread that weaves all the Millennium Development Goals together. You cannot provide, um, improve maternal health, um, eradicate extreme poverty without a, in a universal primary education without addressing uh, electricity needs for these populations. How do you run hospitals? How do you run schools? How do you connect them to today in 2014 without electricity? So um, we, we strongly believe that energy is essential for development and is, is a nexus issue. In our practitioner network, we are very focused on market-led solutions. 
we believe in sustainable business models to really accelerate the sector. And we also want to ensure that we're catalyzing energy services at the country level. We promote adoption of new technologies and provide best uh, practices and peer-to-peer -peer learning through um, new business models and sharing best practices. And in doing so, create a network of networks where specifically anyone who works on this issue can join under our umbrella. Um, as you can see here, um, most of our network is small and medium enterprises. So it's still a very entrepreneurial space. Uh, some more demographics about our network. Overwhelmingly, they're solar, uh, but we allow all types of energy technologies into our network. So we have wind, hydro, biomass, et cetera. Um, we also um, have identified that the main challenge um, is the huge need for funding to really scale these efforts. You can see 70% of our network has highlighted that as their number one challenge, in addition to policy, regulatory issues, and tariffs. But funding is clearly the biggest issue, and I'm gonna go a little bit into that. But first, I wanna talk about um, what our practitioners have been doing in this space and what's been interesting and what we've been promoting. Uh, for example, Azuri Technologies has devised this innovative pay-as-you-go scratch card system so um, consumers can pay for their electricity like they would a utility bill. And they use this with solar household systems and makes it affordable. Um, Bush Foundation in Pakistan they offer a variety of energy solutions, all the way from solar lanterns, which are the small, uh, small units, for especially um, for more of the poorer consumers, all the way up to village level, um, large scale PV solutions. Um, Selco is a famous example in India, which has really focused on tailoring customer um, support and after sales uh, to ensure maintenance and supply of the systems that they install. And two from the Nexus, uh, Econet Solar has uh, successfully partnered with uh, cell phone companies um, and including telecommunications into their sales strategy and linking the need for electricity for IT and, and, and phones. And uh, Promethean Power Systems, which has developed a solar powered refrigerator, which stores dairy units. Um, something like 30% of dairy is spoiled from the, from the farm to the, the customer. So this is a really excellent uh, technology which prevents that spoilage and uses renewable energy to do so. Some of the accomplishments our network has um, achieved is that we created this report on achieving universal energy access by 2030, which is also available on our website. Um, and this includes all the recommendations that practitioners have given as to what is needed to achieve access. And also looking at um, nexus areas like energy and agriculture, energy and health, energy and water. Um, we also established a import tariff and barriers database, which is really useful for practitioners who, you know, maybe want to import solar panels into Kenya, but what are the tariff rates? And here is a one-stop place for them to look up that information. Um, we also worked on um, reducing cost barriers to gain stand access to standards. And excitingly, we're just launching a new initiative um, called Energy and Women's Health, where we're looking at hospital electrification in five countries in Sub-Saharan Africa to determine what, how many clinics don't have access to power and what is needed to bring power to them. So that's um, an issue that UN Foundation is leading. And then last, which I'm gonna go into in the next few slides, um, we developed an investment compendium, which is here. So um, if there's any donors and investors in the room, I have a few copies that I can hand to you, but it's also available on our website, um, which show what is the deal flow needed from our respondents. And this is it. Uh, we had 141 respond, and uh, about 270,000, oh sorry, 270 million is, is what they were requesting to help scale up their uh, businesses. Um, over half our SMEs. So you can see that, um, as uh, Jean talked a little bit earlier about how it's so important to help catalyze um, new innovations and new entrepreneurs, but the funding is a massive barrier here. Um, and uh, mostly they're looking for grant funding, project debt, and project equity uh, is what they're looking for. And I think this slide is actually the most telling here. There are some um, 
There's some funding available for seed. There's funding available for established. But what is really needed is funding for scale. And this is overwhelmingly what res our respondents are we're requesting and seeking. So important, it's really important for investors to look into this space because you have a lot of practitioners who have successfully completed some pilots. Uh, and they want, they need access to capital to really just scale up their um, technologies. So uh, join us uh, if you are interested in this issue. You can sign up energyaccess.org and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, I think if you can um, hold questions, we'll just go right on to the next presentation. Then we'll have uh, plenty of time for some Q&A. David Rothschild is with Skoll Foundation and is going to be giving us another view into uh, a different approach to scaling and also a specific on the ground project. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Rothschild. I work with the Skoll Foundation. Um, and for this presentation, I'm going to briefly introduce the Skoll Foundation and what we do. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the ways that we are looking to address deforestation in tropical forest countries. Um, I'll give a very brief uh, five-minute film that introduces some of the social entrepreneurs that we are supporting and some of the innovations that they have um, to address deforestation, and then move into an example of uh, a innovation that we are helping to support go to scale in the Brazilian Amazon as an example on the ground um, that is that is underway and that does touch on many of the nexus issues. I'm um, looking at governance, uh, looking at um, data transparency, and really looking at addressing deforestation in one of the most critical places in the world to do so. Um, as I said, I work for the Skoll Foundation. Sylvia this morning gave a nice introduction of the whole Jeff Skoll group and the different entities that, that we have. Um, the, uh, she, and she works with the Skoll Global Threats Fund. I work with the Skoll Foundation. Um, some of the other uh, institutions here, participant is uh, the film, television, and, uh, and media platform company that, that is behind Inconvenient Truth, Syriana, Food Inc., um, Lincoln, The Help, um, a number of films with a social message. Um, but again, I work for the Skoll Foundation, and I'm going to focus a little bit on some of the work that we do. Um, the Skoll Foundation looks to find the, the top social innovations in the world that have the greatest promise to create the greatest impact. Um, we're look, we invest, connect, and celebrate social entrepreneurs and other innovators uh, working to solve the world's most pressing problems. We're looking for innovations that have a strong track record with evidence behind them that are already at a type of mezzanine level, but are at a type of inflection point, a moment in time when th what they're working on, their innovation, is ready to go to scale. And what we do, through the Skoll Awards for Social Entrepreneurship, we provide three years of core support funding to those institutions to build their systems to be able to take their innovation to scale. Um, it's really, it's a, it's, we're looking for those groups that aren't necessarily scale up, but aren't established long-term institutions either. Um, we're really looking for that innovative entrepreneurial spirit, but usually in the social sector, usually almost all the organizations that have won the Skoll Award are NGOs. Um, so it's really that balance between taking a sort of venture approach type approach to the NGO world to try and find social innovations that can go to scale. Um, when we talk about social entrepreneurs, we're really talking about society's change agents, the creators of innovations that disrupt the status quo and transform our world for the better. Um, that's really the centerpiece of what the Skoll Foundation does, is try and find those social innovations, give them the support and, uh, and tools they need to take their innovations to scale. Um, and so, this brings me to addressing deforestation in the Amazon. Why did we choose to focus somewhat on deforestation? Deforestation is one of many issues that we focus on, but there's a number of institutions and organizations that we support that do focus on addressing deforestation in the Amazon. Um, and when we saw this sort of opportunity to work in the Amazon, we thought about what's the best way for us to engage in the Amazon? Um, what's a good role for the Skoll Foundation? Well, we looked at lots of different ways to engage, um, and we chose addressing deforestation specifically for a reason. Um, it's not looking at conserving biological diversity. It's not looking at creating protected areas. It's not looking at urban sustainability, which are all super important issues. Um, and I don't mean to demean any of them. Um, but we are looking at the very specific point of view from 
the, the, the framework of trying to look at climate change. How do we really reduce carbon emissions looking at addressing deforestation? And if we're looking at carbon emissions, we're actually looking at trees getting cut down. And when we talk about that, and, and this accounts for somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of carbon emissions in the world can be, can be traced to tropical deforestation. So it's a big chunk of carbon emissions in the world. And it's a big opportunity for the world to really um, take one of the easier, lower hanging fruit to address um, carbon emissions in, a in the near future. Um, so we looked at this as, OK, we need to find this moving frontier. There's a frontier moving across the Amazon of a boom bust economy where you have farmers and ranchers expanding out across the, the Amazon and moving that frontier and, and small towns forming and new ones forming in a boom bust cycle. We actually need to change the way that the rural economy is functioning in the Amazon. And how do you do that? You have to engage landowners. You have to engage bus small business. You have to engage some of the larger international business as well. You have to work with local government. You have to work with national government. Um, it's some of the same stuff that we're talking about in the broader nexus uh, 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 work, is that it's really, it really comes down to how do you work with local government? How do you strengthen municipal governments to be able to, to actually change the way things are happening on the ground in the field? So this brought us to what are the drivers of tropical deforestation? Um, and Brazil and the Amazon being the, the, w the greatest source of carbon emissions from tropical deforestation in the world, and uh, really looking at cattle and soy, uh, farmers and ranchers, as really being the center of why that moving frontier is, ha is happening across the Brazilian Amazon. Um, but f before I get too deep into that, um, I want to talk, uh, I'm going to show a little bit of um, a film that introduces five of our social entrepreneurs that are working to address deforestation. And then it also introduces a little bit about the next step that I'm going to talk about, um, the innovation in the state of Pará in Brazil. And I think I just push this button and it'll play, right? That's my hope. Use the mouse. Okay, thanks. This is a five-minute film, so you don't need to, it'll, it'll be, it, ideally, um, Oh, plus play it again. Thank you. The Amazon is the largest contiguous tropical forest in the world. It plays a critical role in regulating global climate, holding massive amounts of carbon, lot, and emitting 20% right? of the world's life-giving oxygen. Thank you. Today, nearly one-fifth of the rainforest has been cleared to feed global demands for commodities like timber, soy, and beef. But social entrepreneurs across the Amazon have been developing unique approaches and partnerships to save the forest. Amazon Conservation Team, or ACT, helped pioneer the use of mapping technologies with indigenous tribes. We've helped them map 70 million acres. This is a way that they can show the boundaries of their ancestral territories. In neighboring Colombia, Martin von Hildebrandt started fighting for indigenous land rights in the mid-1970s. The first step that had to be taken was get the land. Then we went for 20 million hectares, and now we have 24 million hectares. That's 60 million acres of land, which is now actually owned by indigenous people. In Washington, D.C., another social entrepreneur is working on bold new ways to make saving the forest as profitable as cutting it down. When we launched Forest Trends, we knew that the end game for, for forest conservation globally was when we could make the forest as valuable as all of the things that threaten the forest. Red Plus is one of several initiatives designed to reward people who reduce emissions from deforestation and degradation. It directs funds from countries that emit a lot of carbon to projects that conserve carbon. But the greatest threat of deforestation is now on private land. A case in point, the northeast Brazilian state of Pará, specifically the sprawling county of Paragominas, where by 2008, more than half of the rainforest had been cut down. But even worse than illegal logging was the damage caused by cattle ranching. The Brazilian government intervened to protect the forest. Então resolvemos tomar uma série de medidas. E uma delas foi fazer uma lista 
dos desmatamentos que dos municípios que mais desmatavam na Amazônia. One of them was Patagominas. The government restricted its access to credit and banned the sale of any beef that didn't meet tough new standards that protected the rainforest. Everybody wants to say, what's the solution? Solutions say, you have to stop deforestation. And that's exactly what the citizens of Patagominas decided to do. For help, they turned to another pair of social entrepreneurs, Beto Verissimo and Carlos Sousa of Amazon. One of Amazon's key innovations is the way it uses satellite imagery to fight deforestation. We develop techniques to detect deforestation in a near real time fashion. O Amazon foi fundamental porque nós precisávamos monitorar se havia ou não desmatamento, se as pessoas estavam cumprindo. So just two years after being put on the blacklist, Patagominas became the first county to get off it virtually eliminating deforestation. Today, Amazon has begun working with the governor of the state of Pará to spread this model to 90 other counties throughout the state. Mas o importante, mais do que nunca, com a lógica é a parceria, nós precisamos contar cada vez mais com parcerias que ajudem a difundir isso em toda a Amazônia e sem dúvida ganha a Amazônia, ganha o Brasil e ganha o planeta. It's progress made possible by the combined efforts of social entrepreneurs, government agencies, private enterprise, and other organizations. They've helped secure land rights for indigenous people, provide up-to-date information about deforestation, and compensate people for protecting the forest. Today, the dramatic decline in deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon stands as the single greatest reduction of carbon emissions ever achieved by humankind. Back to count the bottom of the Yep, thank you. And then from my angle, it is the top one, middle one, bottom one. I can't see from here. It's the top one. Top one, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Wrong top one. All right. Here, I'll help you. I can use this. Um, so, thank you very much. Perfect. All right, there you go. And I have this. Perfect. Um, so we decided that one of the one of the areas that we see a potential to really drive significant impact that is of global importance is looking at the state of Pará and Brazil. Um, Pará and Mato Grosso are the two states in Brazil responsible for more deforestation than any other state in the in the Amazon. Um, uh, in, any, uh, in one of the real centers of deforestation in the whole world. And we saw this opportunity, you know, how to work with social entrepreneurs, to work with local government, to really take this model in Paragominas and work to help build the systems, the state systems, to replicate that across all the municipalities, all the rural municipalities in Pará. Um, and we, our partner, Amazon, um, in the, the ones who are sort of leading this, who are working really closely with the state government in Pará, um, one of the in core innovations that, that, that they have, which was alluded to, which was talked about in the film, is the <coughs> ability to take remote sensing changes in satellite imagery, do the logarithms to actually identify the, where those changes in data happen over time, to be able to identify where deforestation is happening, where logging, de de forest degradation is happening, and actually they created logarithms that would predict where deforestation was most likely to happen next. What are those prep points? And at the time, in you know, five years ago, uh, the Brazilian government was only publishing deforestation data once a year. It was a once a year big event that they said, okay, here's the deforestation that happened. We lost 15,000 square kilometers of, of the Amazon last year. Dang, isn't that horrible? Um, and then it was like, oh, and here's where it happened. But it was always back looking. And one of the things that Amazon did was to really revolutionize the way you, that this information can be used. They published the data down to municipal level 
on a monthly basis, predicting where it's going to go next, and then partnered closely with the national government to identify where are the problem spot and how do we create a really strong carrot and stick approach to building governance that will then encourage municipalities to move away from deforestation um, and look to how can to grow businesses in a way that businesses and private landowners operate in a way where they don't have to deforest in order to continue moving, continue improving and growing their business. Um, why Pará? I mean, you can see these are the deforestation rates for different states in the Amazon. This is why we chose Pará. We chose the, one of the hardest and most important places to address deforestation. Um, this is a map that Amazon put together identifying the different places, the different municipalities under pressure. The red ones are areas that have high deforestation. The yellow ones are areas that are under pressure where it's expected to continue to grow in the coming years. Um, our support to Amazon and to the state of Pará was to help them build the state systems, working with the government to develop a green municipality program to replicate what happened in Patagominas across the state. Um, and to help Amazon work in partnership with the municipalities and the government to be able to track deforestation on a monthly basis, not just at the municipal level, but down to the individual landowner level, to then equip the municipalities with the ability to, to license and to register landowners. Um, landowners participated, are, are participating, um, through a process of registering their lands. Um, this opens up th them to be able to grow their business because they're registered, they're uh, complying with law, and it allows them uh, to have a registration which is part of the step towards uh, more stronger tenancy. So there's a serious carrot there, and, and it's not just stick. It's how do you make your business function better? And the reason we, one of the reasons we bring this model up is it's, it's not about punishing people, it's about finding ways to find the right a vision for the future, to partner with landowners to find the right solution for the future. Um, we then partnered, uh, brought in our, we have a partnership with USAID, and USAID last year um, doubled down on our investment. We put in 2.4 million to help Amazon build these systems and to partner with the state. Uh, and then the USA, USAID brought in another 3.6 million to specifically build the capacity of municipalities in those red and yellow areas. Um, to partner with the municipal governments to build their capacity to register lands and to, uh, and to license different legal activities. What's happening here is a process by which rural business, landowners, soy, cattle pr primarily, is shifting in a period of about five years from one where the standard is to operate outside the law and lawlessness is, this was a center, you know, 10 years ago if you look at the news from Pará, you will see gangs controlling r rural rural economy, um, almost no compliance, um, uh, sort of like a, a considered the wild west of the Amazon, where people were scared to go there. Um, today, what is happening is the majority of landowners are actually registered, and if they're through registration, they also get, are monitored for deforestation. The registration process allows Amazon to actually be able to track their. Uh, their land and detect where deforestation is happening. But you're seeing a transformation of the way rural business works. You're seeing what happened in the Dust Bowl in the United States, which took 50 years uh, for a whole technological advancement process of the way that farming was happened. You're seeing it happen in five to 10 years here. A dramatic acceleration of a change in the way people, rural businesses operate. Um, and that's, that's the big goal. It's to modernize, increase actual production, but at the same time, increase sustainability. Um, and it's a, it, it can be a win-win-win situation. Um, these, are the, these, these are all of the uh, municipalities that actually signed up for the Green Municipalities Program with the state. Um, so as you can see, it is almost every rural county. Um, and it covers all of the ones um, that are under pressure, um, ex oh, except for that one, which is being still negotiated. But <laughs> I don't want to see. Um, and this here, this is, this is uh, Simon Jatene, the governor of the state of Pará. You saw him in there. This is during the Rio Plus 20 conference. This is the moment when he made his public commitment to say, we are going for net zero deforestation by 2020. That's him saying zero. He's, um, and this is, as a governor of the state that is the largest amount of deforestation in the world, a dramatic, serious BHAG goal. Big, hairy, audacious goal. 2020 net zero deforestation. What does that mean, net zero? Net zero means, um, it doesn't mean zero deforestation. It means that when deforestation happens, it is planned, it is thought through, it is, and there is compensation. Um, 
that means that it is licensed. And so when there's a big project that comes through and it wants to negotiate something, uh, you know, whether it be a dam or a mine or some other, uh, or a road, that whatever deforestation that has to happen, whoever's behind it or the, gov or the government as well, will pay for reforestation or creation of, of or new protected areas. Um, what this net zero deforestation concept does is brings into the legal framework the, the whole process of licensing and how the decisions are made around development in rural Pará. Um, at the time, this was a super uh, a dramatic uh, declaration, but the, the, the net zero deforestation by 2020 is a goal that is starting to get picked up by many different um, companies around the world. And so while we're working with uh, and we're trying to help municipal governments, local landowners go through that transformation and build a sustainable society in rural, in rural Amazon Brazil, at the same time, pressure is needed from the top down. And a lot of companies have actually made net zero deforestation commitments to work towards that. And you're seeing even companies that have been attacked for their deforestation, for their, their role in creating deforestation in the past, are starting to move towards commitments for sustainable supply chains and for a, a goal of net zero deforestation by 2020. Um, the Consumer Goods Forum uh, has, a, as a forum, made some, some fascinating forward-looking commitments. Um, but you can, uh, you can, I recommend go to the Consumer Goods Forum and check, take a look at it. It's important to have that top-down level of pressure at the same time that you're working with local communities. Um, and lastly, I wanted to say about, and then I'll wrap up, um, data transparency. The whole concept of where we're moving with data transparency and, and remote sensing, and um, Sylvia alluded to it this morning, um, the work that e Amazon did to create a system to do month-to-month -to -month deforestation monitoring, they've been working really closely with, with Google and a number of other partners to develop a way for that type of monitoring to happen on a more global scale. And now to, the World Resources Institute just launched Global Forest Watch a few weeks ago, which does exactly what Amazon was doing in the Brazilian Amazon for forests around the world. So the monthly reports where deforestation is happening. This allows companies that want sustainable supply chains to be able to look at the areas where they're, 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 where they're sourcing from and actually go scroll down and see the land and they can actually c check on their supply chains themselves. This allows governments beyond Brazil all nine countries of the Amazon Basin, you know, Indonesia, Central Africa, to do the types of innovative work that Amazon was doing in the Brazilian Amazon for the past five years. Now the capacity is there. And the world is getting more and more open, more and more data transparency. It, it seems to be the, 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 the pressure for that to be the norm. And this is the type of initiative where we're going to see a lot more possibility for the whole world to move towards a net zero deforestation model by 2020. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right, so um, questions. Anybody have questions for any panelist? Sure, we'll start up here and we'll get to you. I have quite a number of questions, but just to put things a bit in uh, context, can we have an idea from the three speakers, you know, what is the budget which we are talking about in the different um, programs being presented, the number of staffs, and then also when you give us the budget and the hard figures, can you also reflect on the fact uh, what I have been thinking about since I came to this conference? How can we nexus all these different initiatives? Yeah. And particularly when it goes to, um, to deforestation, which I know a little bit about. You know, there are so many initiatives happening out there. And if we could nexus these initiatives much better, then maybe you know, we could have a much bigger impact. And as you, I wanted to find, hear your feelings. Is, is a concrete recommendation coming out from this conference that indeed we should have ways and means, just like your remote system, but then remote sensing system, but then for projects, so people can link with each other and people can amplify each other. Thank you. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. One of the things that I think we're very interested in and in adding into the declaration is that whole context of what's the, where is the convening power used? And I think bringing together the nexus scene, the ones who are in the right area would be powerful. David, you want to comment on that? Um, sure. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, you have to, um, I agree with a lot of your points. That, I mean, the nexus. The, the nexus is at the core of so much of what why we're all here and what we're doing. And, and working in in the Brazilian Amazon, you know, agriculture, water use, 
energy. I mean, they're obviously all tied up together. And what we're trying to do with in, in Para is provide an example for ways where you can see an imp imp uh, the more traditional development and improves in people's lives, but at the same time in a sustainable way. Um, and really modeling uh, low carbon agriculture as, and when I talked about this, the, the, that sort of the five year Dust Bowl equivalent change in modernization, we're really talking about um, a process which uh, more low carbon agriculture farming is happening, um, but it's, the uptake is not as fast as it should be. And there is a need for more convening and sharing, and um, and uh, yeah, I mean and I agree with your saying. And there's clearly a need for more funding, but I think that all of these different sectors. I mean, as Anari mentioned this morning, yep. The Skull Foundation, or you mean for the the initiative I was talking about? So the we we support so the 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 organization Amazon, um, you know, we supported them with uh, 2.5 million dollars, and USAID supported with 3.5. Um, and that's over three years, four years total between those. The state government of Pará, um, for to take to scale the um, the the green municipalities initiative across all the municipalities, um, <laughs> recently received I think it's 40 million dollars from the Amazon Fund, which is sourced from Norway, um, to help pay for that to help them build their systems out. Um, so yeah, it's it's not cheap. Um, we're talking about helping build local governance. Um, we're trying to help move from a model of where the central government sort of enforces environmental regulation to one where, where municipal, local governments help manage sustainability. Um, I want to hear from Anari first, so see if you have a question. Um, well, just uh, going back to the UN Sustainable Energy for All initiative, I think that's one of the things they're really trying to do is look at all these nexus issues that intersect it. Um, one of the problems with that too though is there's so many cooks in the kitchen it can be really hard to manage <laughs> all these initiatives and that's one of the things that they're the, the executive team is trying to figure out is how to work with everybody who has a stake in energy so um, I, th I think that's still it, it's important but it still needs to a little bit of um, 